welcome to the British Library, or should I say the British Library's backyard, because here we are right behind it. My name's B. Rolat, I work in the cultural events team, and we've got a real corker for you tonight. It's a look into the Trans Archive with our panel of brilliant experts. If you've got any questions during this event, please put them in the box below. We are also looking for donations to the work of the British Library. If you can donate, that would be wonderful. Also, if you can give us audience feedback, that's much appreciated. Um, sadly, the building's closed, but we are open online and there's loads more events, so please check out our programme. And thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand over now to our brilliant chair, DM. Over to you, DM. Hi, and a warm welcome to a look into the Trans Archive and also a warm welcome to the Living Knowledge Network. If you need captions, uh, there are closed captions for this event, so just turn them on um, at the bottom of the screen. My name is Diane Withers. I'm a research fellow on a project called the Business of Women's Words, which is based at the British Library. And as part of this role, I've had the good fortune to be a curatorial consultant for the exhibition Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights, which this event is in dialogue with. Unfinished Business features different facets of the archive from what we might call the cultural archive represented in objects such as the first edition of Virginia Woolf's time-traveling gender-bending novel Orlando to debates about uh, the social and medical constructions of sex in the 1930s to activism from the late 90s and early 21st century uh, which aimed to secure and did secure um, legal rights and human rights for trans people through the 2004 Gender Recognition Act. More broadly, and throughout the exhibition, it looks at how across history, medicine and technology have both constrained and expanded the social meanings of women and womanhood, as well as the conceptual categories of sex and gender. Over the next hour, we're going on a 200 plus year sprint through the trans archive from the 19th century to the present. We have four fantastic speakers and each will cover a period in trans history. This will be, out of necessity, only a snapshot of those periods of history, but we hope it will inspire you to look further into the trans archive in the future. Covering the 19th century is Professor Arne Harlman of Cardiff University, who is author of, among many things, Neo-Victorian Biographelia and James Miranda Barry, A Study in Transgender and Transgenre. Covering the 1930s is Dr. Claire Tebbert, who is Assistant Professor in Gender Studies from Trinity College, Dublin. Talking us through the post-war period is Adrian Kane Galbraith, a doctoral candidate from the University of Washington in the US. Christine Burns will talk through the 1990s to the present, reflecting on her activism with Press for Change, who did so much to secure legal and human rights for trans people in the UK. Each participant is going to speak for around six to eight minutes and there'll be ample time for audience questions at the end. So if you'd like to ask a question, please do so at it in the text box at the bottom of the screen. You can do that at any point throughout the next hour or at the end. And I will do my best to field your questions to our fantastic speakers. We are taking a chronological approach. So Arne is, is uh, going first from the 19th century and we're going to work our way up to the present. So without further ado, please take it away, Arne. And enjoy. Okay, hello, this is me. Um, my brief is to speak about um, transgender in the long 19th century. And could I have the first slide, please? Okay, so um, I want to begin with um, the uh, a shift in thought at the end of the 19th century uh, to the early 20th century in medical science, sexology, and how this shift uh, led to the emergence of a discourse of transgender. And then I uh, work my way backwards and talk about two uh, very prominent trans people, uh, the, the French diplomat, uh, the, the uh, Chevalier Deon, um, and um, then uh, James Barry. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? Okay. Um, at the end of the 19th century, sexologists, um, started to um, uh, develop a discourse which sought to decriminalize homosexuality. And in this homosexual discourse, the discourse of homosexuality, they developed um, a language uh, of transgender. So transgender was first cast in relation to homosexuality. So Havelock Ellis on the left in um, his 1897 uh, book on sexual inversion, um, 
described the homosexual as an invert um, in a language um, in the language of transgender. A homosexual man was a female soul trapped in a male body, and a homosexual woman was a male soul trapped in a female body. In the early 20th century, um, a, a, an alternative term was offered by Edward Carpenter. Uh, the intermediate sex, Edward Carpenter himself gay, um, coined the notion of a third sex, an intermediate sex between female, between the binaries. And in 1910, um, next slide please. In 1910, the German um, sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld, for the first time, disambiguated homosexuality and transgender in his book on transvestites, where he made the point that um, the impulse to uh, cross-dress and the, and the um, uh, sense of a, a different sex identity were not necessarily linked to homosexuality. Havelock Ellis followed this up by um, criticizing uh, the idea of transvestism uh, and saying that um, uh, cross-dressing did not necessarily uh, come with uh, a sense of different sex identity. And instead of his own earlier version of uh, inversion and his and um, Hirschfeld's notion of transvestism, he suggested eonism in his 1928 book. Ionism, next slide please. Ionism was adapted, was inspired by the French late 18th century, early 19th century diplomat, uh, Chevalier Deon, who presented in both genders, um, uh, uh, in our own terms, a gender fluid individual who refused to um, identify one gender as the true gender. Um, created enormous, um, uh, an enormous sense of sensation, but also considerable anxiety uh, to the point that a court case um, was um, held to decide the chevalier sex and the court case decided that the chevalier was female. Um, in, um, uh, in, in their shock, the Chevalier left for France, where the same thing happened, and a royal edict um, issued uh, the inj injunction that the Chevalier live as a woman. So, in a sense, um, uh, gender, when, uh, when the categories are blurred, historically speaking, masculinity needs to be uh, retained as a pure category, and anything else is, is feminized. Um, the, um, uh, the case of James Barry offers a different uh, example. Next slide, please. Barry um, chose to transition, uh, not biologically, uh, but chose to transition from one sex and identity, from one gender and identity to another. Uh, born a uh, female, um, he uh, reinvented himself as James Barry um, at age 20. Um, uh, and uh, attained um, a very considerable um, uh, reputation as a military surgeon, reaching the highest uh, rank in the medical branch of the, uh, the, the British Army, working in the colonies um, uh, in, and um, um, a pioneer of uh, sanitary reform 30 years before Florence Nightingale, with whom he clashed at the end of his career quite significantly. Um, and um, also um, a proponent of the rights of um, um, minority groups uh, and oppressed groups. Um, two slides on, please. Um, in, um, it was only after Barry's death that um, the woman who laid out the body claimed that she had found um, a female body. This was unverified. The body had already been buried in an epidemic. Um, and uh, it was not until the 1980s that an art historian found legal evidence of documents that identified the female birth identity of James Barry as Margaret Barclay, the niece of history painter James Barry, from whom he uh, adopted his, his name. Now, in contradistinction to the Chevalier, whose uh, fluid uh, uh, gender performance inspired sexology to, um, to start a discourse of transgender, Barry, 
because his life anticipated organized feminism in the Victorian period, um, has been placed as female rather than trans. Uh, this is understandable in terms of Victorian feminists. Um, he um, spoke um, for the rights of prostitutes, for example, which was a very prominent cause uh, for feminists uh, later on. His um, year of death coincided with the first former medical um, uh, woman, uh, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, uh, being um, uh, completing her studies and the suffragettes in the early 20th century uh, represented um, the, the feminist uh, struggle as a struggle by Amazons. Uh, but up to our own period, Bari um, is, has been represented as a woman rather than as trans, which is um, it is surprising. Apart from two books, uh, the third of four biographies by Rachel Holmes, which is um, on the second half of the picture, and um, um, and uh, Patricia Danka's novel. Um, last slide, please. When I wrote my book um, about the cultural history of James Barry and representations of uh, James Barry, um, I was drawn to um, a um, a picture of uh, the uh, the older Barry, um, enormously confident, which I then had adapted for for my uh, for my picture and for my cover uh, against the background of um, uh, Table Mountain in in South Africa, and it was only afterwards that I discovered that this picture, which I um, sourced from a, an archive. Um, telling them it was um, the med medical surgeon James Barry, was James Barry, but a different James Barry, um, a double, um, whose life um, more or less coincided with um, uh, my James Barry, um, who also lived um, for a long time in, in Cape Town, was a wine merchant and later a uh, member of the Legislative Assembly. And um, this, uh, I think I want to end with this because it uh, shows some unexpected discoveries we can actually uh, make in our archival research that at first uh, may um, may send us into some kind of, um, uh, well, anxiety, but actually in this case, nothing is more relevant than uh, this um, confusion because it represents Bari's own uh, very deliberate confusion of his origins. Um, he uh, invented three um, years of birth, uh, different mothers, etc., for himself. Uh, and it also shows the difficulties of um, tracing and of researching um, historical transgender because with prominent figures, the, the facts are very difficult to reconstruct when the myth has subsumed the personality and it's the cultural myth and the cultural construction of the figure that uh, is uh, has has in a way um, pushed us to the margins the the actual uh, personality and I'm, I've come to my the end of my talk now. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to be moving us on into the 1930s and if I can get my slides up please. So um, I'm starting here in 1930 um, with a front page image from the popular newspaper, The Daily Mirror, and you have on the left hand side of the page very happy looking um, newlywed called Evan Burt. And the reason I'm emphasizing this story is this, I believe, marks a moment in the 1930s when there's this kind of slightly surprising um, window of possibility where there's a whole series of stories that seem now to be very positive trans stories. And in many ways, they speak to an intersex history. They speak to lives of people whom we might now um, more readily see as intersex, but who are sort of viewed through a variety of lenses that um, 
kind of put them within this history that is trans, that is genderqueer, that is non-binary, that is intersex, that speaks to a past that is very much about people grappling with sex and gender identities. So very much coming from the ideas that Anna's just discussed in the 19th century of coming out of the ideas of sexology. You have here Evan Burt and his lovely wife, um, um, Sarah Edwards, on their wedding day. And what is the story, the reason this makes front page news is because in the words of the Daily Mirror, you know, Evan has lived for 29 years as a woman. This is what makes the story um, kind of newsworthy. But it's in many ways very positive. We have for sure this kind of construction of that terrible trope of the before and after photo, but it's slightly reversed. You have, um, you know, kind of the idea of Evan being really foregrounded as this successful husband who is being celebrated for having married his long-term girlfriend. Um, you know, this is really celebrated in all of the stories. And the fact that, you know, here is someone in this small Wiltshire village, you know, in the southwest of England, who has doubted um, his identity for a while, has written off, um, has sought approval, um, has, you know, sort of looked for this judgment and has had it verified. And when you go to the Wiltshire record offices, when you look at the birth register for Evan Burtz, you see that it's been corrected. And it may seem like a small thing, but it's massive, you know, this was a moment when somebody could say, you know, actually, I'm a man, you, we got this wrong. And you could put that line through it, you could cross it out and correct it. So here we have Evan Burt getting married and it being framed as a successful story. Moving on to the next slide, we move forward six years to 1936, which is the year in which there are the most of these stories. It's a real kind of um, key year in terms of thinking about these intersex and trans histories. You have, again, as a front, um, sort of front page story, um, alongside the baby being saved from the lion, which, you know, always a great story. You have Mark Weston, again, getting married to his long-term girlfriend, you know, very much a celebration of heterosexuality, but very much a celebration of Mark Weston, um, the male figure here, who had lived up until this point um, under uh, the identity he'd been assigned at birth as a woman. And again, he has this realization that this is not correct, that he is a man and he seeks medical um, support. And this is, supported. He gets medical and legal recognition that indeed he is correct, he is a man. And a large part of this story is that he is intersex. You would not get this from the popular press accounts. And this newspaper story is just one of these moments. It is just one um, press story. You can see here it's front page news. It merits um, the sort of front page uh, photo. But this is a story that is being circulated around the world through the Anglophone press and beyond. It has been circulated through the local press. It is something that is being picked up and circulated again and again, and that then becomes reiterated again and again in stories. And one of the reasons why Mark Weston's story is significant is that Mark had already achieved a degree of fame um, within sports. He'd had a career within um, sort of what was seen as women's sport. And this is partly why 1936 is such a key year, because 1936 is the year of the Berlin Olympics, the so-called Nazi Olympics. And there is a massive debate in that summer of 1936 that has so many resonances when you look at the injustices and terrible rhetoric that is going on until this day around intersex athletes. Um, in 1936, this is already happening. You have these questions being played out. Who qualifies when you have this binary opposition of sex segregation within sport? 
who qualifies as a woman athlete. And so you have Mark Weston, who has won medals in the women's shot put, um, now um, realising that he's a man and being affirmed in that. The debate that goes on is how can anybody know quite who gets to qualify as a woman? So if we move on to the next slide, you have another athlete, in this case, the Czech um, 800 meter runner, Zdenek Kubek, who again um, is raised in these discussions around the 1936 Olympics. You have again, what I think is a really beautiful and affirming photo of Kubek here in his athletic gear, in this real kind of um, muscle pose. Um, and at the same time, you have this language of the man woman. It's a language that is predates the 1930s. Um, if we move on to the next slide, you see from 1929, one of the kind of classic um, cases of the genre of somebody who's been assigned female at birth and then keeps on asserting himself to be male in the face of so much societal opposition, here Colonel Barker. And again, with the newspaper um, front page story with image, here you have this heading of man woman. It's a category that is not medical, but attests to this idea of gender fluidity, of ideas of the difficulties of ascribing a definite male or female identity to some people. In some ways, I think it sounds like a really um, pathologizing category, but I would also argue that there's a real scope within it. It's maybe the kind of um, space of non-binary of its time, although it's much more expansive than that. If we move on to the final slide, um, we move forward to 1938 and the real kind of um, moment that reinforces the surgeon and endocrinologist, um, so sort of hormone specialist, who's behind a lot of this, which is the South African um, Lennox Ross Broster. And you see here this classic trans narrative of the surgeon having all of the agency. So we have a picture of Donald Purcell, um, another man who has been assigned female at birth and is now asserting himself to be male. And the headline, doctor changes sex of 24, patients have married. Again, the agency is on the surgeon, Lennox Ross Broster, um, there is this idea of um, kind of agency for Donald Purcell and the sort of smaller photo is again of a potential bride for him because none of these stories are complete without the kind of, you know, sort of speculating as to some sort of heterosexual love interest. But really you start to see this pernicious discourse of the medical um, gatekeeping coming through as early as 1938. So this is my whirlwind tour of the sort of 1930s and the ways in which there is a massive interest centered around ideas of sex change as a phrase that gets used again and again that really refers to ideas of intersex and the potential for the body to be changing to be changeable and this idea of the man woman being replaced by notions of medical intervention and the need for sort of medical verification to be that gatekeeping role and decide who gets to um, decide who can identify as who they are. Thank you. All right. Well, hello all. Uh, I'll be taking us into the uh, 1950s and 60s looking specifically at a uh, registration of trans people within the national insurance system. Sounds like a dry topic, I know, but bear with me. I thought I would start in the spirit of the history of national insurance with its tables and tables of statistics with a few noteworthy numbers. So 631, that's the number of people who between 1954 and 1975 applied to change the sex designation on their national insurance card from female to male or vice versa. 522, 
that's how many of those applications were accepted. In other words, people who we know were issued government documentation that officially recognized them as men or women, despite them having been assigned a different sex at birth. And finally, 779, that's how many images I have on my camera of individual documents held in the National Archives at Kew under these MPNI folders with the heading change of sex. So what these numbers added up to for me was a surprise. I'd set out on my dissertation research knowing there was going to be at least some traces of trans presence in the mid-century archives, but I wasn't expecting to find civil servants in the 1950s already grappling with the fact that legal sex is not a self-evident category, let alone actually updating so many people's identity documents. So how did this policy come about? Was the Ministry of Pensions and National Insurance some bastion of progressive thought? Well, not quite. Uh, in fact, this rigid binary definition of sex, uh, and sex being a term that MPNI officers use to refer to a person's physiology, their internal sense of self, and their social presentation, this was integral to the post-war contributory welfare system. So it was assumed that men would be the main wage earners for their households, and thus the National Insurance Act 1946 established lower levels of unemployment and sickness benefit for women along with a whole host of other differentials uh, between men and women. Moreover, until 1975, employers had to record a worker's contributions by placing physical stamps each week on their national insurance card, which a booklet was a booklet and it proclaimed in block letters in the upper left corner, whether the bear was a man or a woman. This card also served as proof of identity at local insurance offices or employment exchanges it was, in other words, impossible to work during these decades without being able to consistently prove with appropriate documents which kind of worker you were. The irony, however, was that by placing sexual identity documentation at the heart of this male breadwinner state, the MPNI kind of risked undermining its own ideological foundations because the reality was that sex was neither easy to define nor always consistent across a worker's life. So insurance officers got their first taste of the difficulties this could create when in December 1954, a young trans man called Vincent Jones pled guilty to representing himself as a bachelor on his marriage certificate. This ignited a storm of tabloid coverage that implicated the MPNI in his supposed deception. I am a man, Jones explained to the Daily Express after the trial, but if you mean physically, I still have female organs. I have been to doctors to get my sex changed and I am sick of waiting. Imagine, few of us can relate to that. Uh, however, the tabloids reported Jones had acquired a male national insurance card while he was waiting, which enabled him, at least up to this point, to live and work unremarked as a man. So it's a testament to the MPNI's sensitivity about its public image that within days, the solicitor, Jay Vaughn, sent a memo to his colleagues about this issue. Vaughn professed himself sympathetic to the plight of people like Jones, but at their core, his concerns were pragmatic. Because the national insurance card was such a ubiquitous feature of working life, a, a passport to employment, he called it, transitioning people were likely to face public embarrassment if there was a mismatch between their social appearance and the sex marker on their card. They might be forced to fall back on the strained mercies of the means-tested welfare system instead of becoming working, dues-paying, useful citizens. Hence, he argued, and his argument was affirmed by the April 1955 memorandum, Persons of Doubtful Sex, there's a title for you, sex change should be recognized as a reality. However, MPNI officers were equally eager to ensure that bad publicity like that following the Jones trial wasn't repeated. Persons of doubtful sex also required that all requests for sex redesignation be forwarded to the chief medical officer of the MPNI, who would assess, and I quote, whether it would be proper and to the advantage of the person concerned that they should be treated as one sex or the other. This limited, gate-kept form of gender recognition, thus, was a double-edged sword. The emphasis on unuseful citizenship or on propriety created kind of an implicit hierarchy in terms of whose applications for new cards were likely to succeed. There's no information, for instance, in these files about how applicants were racialized, but I think the omission might be significant in itself. 
given how what we know about how gender normativity in the UK is bound up with whiteness then as now. I also found two instances where applicants had their requests for new cards delayed because they'd recently claimed disability benefit uh, for mental health issues. And women, particularly women who are married to other women or who worked in marginal economies, faced kind of the brunt of the MPNI's systemic misogyny. In April and August 1961, for instance, uh, MPNI officers discovered that a woman they'd issued a female card had been arrested while doing street sex work. It's an economic reality that comes up in quite a few of these case files. She lived with another trans woman, her partner, Miranda Parr, I should say, these, are all, these names are all pseudonyms, I should clarify, uh, who had also more recently acquired nas female national insurance status. Parr's status was challenged on the basis of this relationship. By giving her a card, was the MPNI not supporting a domestic arrangement that diverged widely from the heterosexual family unit national insurance was supposed to uphold, and thereby risking trouble with tabloids or the law? Perhaps surprisingly, though, in Parr's case, as in all but 83 of the 631 applications uh, recorded during this period, departmental pragmatism swung in favor of recognition. The chief medical officer's rejoinder to the legal department's hesitancy about Parr was, was rather tart. Uh, Parr, he wrote, had come in with a certification from a reputable psychiatrist and, and I quote, both these persons wish to live as females. In fact, the evidence is that they are doing so. Homosexual practices between females are not a crime. I agree that the main fact that both live at the same address does not establish that anything is happening which might eventually embarrass the ministry and that it would be best to leave things as they are. The practice of recognizing sex, change of sex for national insurance purposes thus seems to have been tied as much to administrative rationality as it was to questions of morals. And administration, that is the the selective accommodation of sexual difference that helps preserve the image of normativity on which the system is founded, seems to have won out in most cases for the better part of two decades. The process has left traces of trans presence in the high policy world of the National Archives, stories embedded in the statistics that show how long really trans people have been demanding to be recognized as who we are. I wanna close then with humbling but exciting reflection that these stories are just the tip of the iceberg, that there's no doubt much more trans presence to be uncovered and much more that may never be uncovered in the archive. For one, non-binary people are invisible here, even if they opted to change their designation from one binary opt-in to another, there's no record of their non-binary identity. For another thing, the 631 people who appear in the annals of the social insurance system are only those whose local officers decided to pass their files up the chain to the central office. There's actually evidence to suggest that local officers sometimes issued new cards without thinking twice. In one recorded interview from 1976, for instance, a consultant at a London hospital recalled that, and I quote, the question of an employment card is solved very simply, or has been by our patients, by merely going to the office and saying, you have put down Mr. Kenneth Smith on this form, there is a mistake. My name's Kathleen Smith. The clerk looks up and immediately agrees and issues a new card. Sometimes recognition can be as simple as that. Thank you, Thank you Adrian. Um, I, I think I need to put, pick myself up off the floor. I used to say as an as a, as a adolescent and young adult that I hated history when I was at school. Um, I could actually see no relevance in it to, to, to my life, um, which is a shame because um, all I had in order to try and understand myself when I was about 12 years old in the mid-1960s was beginning to read about people like April Ashley um, in, the, in the news of the world. Um, and I think the thing that has been a feature of much of the last 60 years for me has been the knowledge that the way in which we talk about uh, trans people, unlike all the previous three speakers who are actually going from some way of excavating what actually happens, is through the lens of the press and how it distorts um, what our lives are. Um, so that is actually in itself influenced the trajectory 
of trans people. Um, but if I can actually just go back a little bit, the way I've actually looked at trans um, history um, is in a number of phases. I think if we look from all the way back to the 1700s to the Chevalier Dion and all the way through to the 1930s, 40s, 50s, the stories that are documented about trans people um, tend to be about individuals. There is no sense of trans people ever meeting other trans people. Um, we have since learned there are one or two instances. For instance, uh, the famous uh, trans man um, whose name has immediately disappeared off my list, um, Michael Dillon, um, he actually uh, tried to form a relationship with another uh, trans person, Roberta Cowell, in the 1950s. But other than that, I think most of these people were actually lived as solitary individuals trying to work out a solution to their what seemed like unique problem in their own way. And again, just to bring it back to myself, I remember in the mid 1960s as a, as a child um, dressing up in my uh, departed um, sister's clothes, thinking, was I the only person like me in the world? Was I a unique kind of freak, which actually makes it even more frightening to be. Um, but we don't actually see trans people coming together and talking to each other in, a, in any kind of supportive or political way until we get to the mid 1960s with the formation of something called the, the Beaumont Society, um, which actually provided a, a, a forum for whether it was people who were cross-dressed or people who saw themselves as transsexual to come together and actually discuss their life experience, pass tips, um, uh, sh share information about where they might be able to get help, uh, what to avoid if they were out in the world, if they, if they got into trouble. Um, so this second phase was one of uh, mutual uh, self-support. Um, and it amazes me that that was the model for, again, uh, just over 20 years that we didn't actually progress. I grew up, I graduated, I went, I got, I got a job. I struggled with my identity, not even knowing that that existed until um, the, um, the later 70s. And my only points of reference, apart from the press, were uh, books. And books were extremely hard to come by. I remember my excitement the first time I heard on, the, on a, a radio program, uh, a review of a book by a journalist called Jan Morris, um, who had written her own autobiography about her transition. Um, I now know it wasn't the first, but at the time we all regarded it as being the, the first example of, uh, you know, a, a true a true story of a trans person actually finding the way to uh, to, to surgical transition, um, and then. Later in the 70s, uh, towards the end of the 1970s, there was a television documentary uh, featuring somebody called Julia Grant, which again showed a way. Um, but these things are extremely few and far between. And um, we, we noticed them and we pounced upon them. But otherwise, there wasn't a lot to be seen. So just as if you go back 200 years, um, we have a paucity of examples. I don't believe that the examples we have, for instance, from the 19th century of one or two people are the beginning and end of the story. Those are the people who came to notice for one for some reason or other through their notoriety, uh, as in the case of James Barry, or in the case of um, press reports, or because people got into trouble with the law, because for a long time it was unlawful to, uh, to, to, to go about outside dressed as a member of the opposite sex, and therefore some of, the, some of the other records that we have from the 19th century are people being brought before the law to be punished for their, um, their, you know, what they were doing. So we didn't, throughout that 20, 25 years of support organizations up until towards the end of the, uh, I think I've had my six minutes, uh, at the end of the, the um, 1980s, um, that was just support. There was no uh, activist organisation. 
And that's actually where the next part of the trans story begins. Um, now, obviously, I've run out of time, uh, but I've, what I want to emphasize is that my life would have been so much different if I had known a fraction of what we are discussing today about historical figures and particularly how our uh, experience um, historically has be, had been erased culturally. Um, and I think looking at today with a, with a backlash that is about four years old now, which is rooted mainly in misinformation and, and fear, I can't help feeling that the conversation there would be an awful lot different if the people involved were actually you know, studying the stuff that we've studied. So I've grown up to realize not only is uh, what you call history, I call childhood, um, but that's uh, history and being able to excavate this, these, these pieces of evidence of people's lives is vitally important to having a rational conversation about trans lives. I finished. Yeah, fantastic. That's a, a great point. A great point to finish on, Christine. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the speakers. That was just incredible. An absolute kind of riot through the through these centuries of, of so much stuff, so much stuff happening. Um, I've got quite a few questions coming through. So I am going to start and I think also picking up what you were saying, Christine, by perhaps gesturing to the longer history. So this is a question from Jonah Coman. Um, by starting in the 19th century and the invention of language for trans people, it might be implied that trans folk are a modern phenomenon and that there were no trans people before that. But how did the 19th century medical, historical and ph philosophical writers build on an entire history of trans and gender variant folk? And I suppose that's a, a question about you know, how were they building on particular kind of mythologies or imaginaries and, and what stories or ideas were they drawing on? So if anyone can speak, uh, speak to that, that would be, be helpful. So the longer history, because, you know, we're conscious of, we certainly in this event, we certainly don't want to suggest that trans history begins and ends in the 19th century, but I should have said this in the introduction. The reason why this periodization has been imposed on this panel is because it mirrors the um, time period covered in the exhibition. So, um, so yeah, anyone want to have a go at that? The question. Well, shall, I, shall I just say that I think that historians like uh, scientists as well uh, are always uh, constrained by the fact that they're human beings living in their time, using the concepts of their time, the language of their time. So uh, when we see you know, the, le the late 19th century uh, beginning to codify uh, the position of the law against people who were homosexual, the Le uh, Amendment, um, is means that trans people who are sort of instinctively are regarded as being somehow, but we don't quite understand how, associated with all that stuff, tend to, first, I think, to be described erroneously within the same language. So as people start to talk about sexual inversion, um, tr trans people, whether they are simply uh, heterosexuals who are cross-dressing or trans people who are genuinely feeling very strongly that they uh, want to live their life um, in the, the opposite gender role to the one they're issued with, um, tend to be described within that same, that same framework. But that's why the work of uh, Hirschfeld is so important in actually beginning to, to, to and have a lock Ellis as well, begin to break open that egg and actually separate out the white and the yolk so that uh, we could talk about those things differently. Sure, has anybody else got anything they want to um, respond to Jonah Coman's question? Uh, don't, don't have to. Um, one of the things that I think I'm really interested in just because of the experience of doing research for the exhibition and you know kind of trying to find trans lives in the archive is the the conceptual 
and archival sources really in, in where does where does one go to find it and I think we've got a massive massively helpful glimpse of that in your presentation so the the national archives local record offices that kind of thing so I just wondered if you were able to elaborate on the different sites where you might go if you wanted to do more research on the history of trans lives and the kind of approaches you might want to take if you were doing that. Claire, do you want to answer that? Yeah, sure. So a lot of my work has been looking at the popular press, which um, as Christine sort of picked up on, you know, it's certainly not without its image, uh, without its problems. Um, there's the advantage of looking at the popular press is that you know, a particular particular moment, it has a massive circulation. You are getting access to something that is reaching, you know, kind of vast swathes of the population, and you are getting to see how particular ideas are being framed and put out there. Um, it just happens that in the 1930s, some of that is being framed more positively, so it's not quite as um, painful as it might be looking at it at other points. Um, also, I mean, it's one of those things where um, you are looking for people in the past. And I think it's a really key point that kind of Christine raises as well about looking at individuals and trying to think about how you might move beyond that, um, that there's not necessarily these kind of group formations that you can look for. So for example, I've spent a lot of time in medical archives and it means necessarily that you're looking at uh, sort of trans identities, intersex identities that are much more medicalized, but then you're finding those moments that kind of creep through. You find the moments in the discussions between medics when they're actually considering people's lives or you're finding the letters that people are writing in. You're finding those moments when you're getting slight moments um, of agency or you're getting um, kind of if not agency, you're at least starting to see um, some of the less official discourse of the of the medics and, you know, getting to see kind of what's going on. But it's necessarily, it's not perfect. It's, yeah, really trying to just look between, betwixt and between to find what there is. Yeah. Adrian, I can see your, your head nodding fear <laughs> in relation to what they're saying there. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think following up both on this and on the question of terminology, mm -hmm. uh, as somebody who started doing my research in 2017, I think a huge influence on, on just the ability to do the kind of project that I'm doing across the National Archives, across the British Library, the Wellcome Library, uh, the Hall Carpenter Archives, all these archives, is the advent of searchable catalog systems and better metadata, better tagging, um, of subjects related to trans people. There was a learning curve though, which I found was interesting. I started out kind of searching the archive for, for the modern terminology um, that, you know, that I hope to find, or, or indeed for, for medical terms like, like transsexual, which uh, was pretty common in the, in the mid 20th century US, which is where a lot of the trans history that's been written is centered. But I actually, didn't find a lot of files tagged with this term transsexual, um, this specific medical term. Instead, what I was finding was a continuation of the term sex change um, that Claire develops a lot in her own work um, <laughs> as this kind of nebulous catch-all category that refers partly to social transition and partly to, to physical transition and covers people who we would now classify as intersex as well as people who would now classify as trans. This term has a long afterlife. Um, and once I've figured that out, being able to plug that term in to catalogs across in all these sites across the UK and in fact the world, um, I was able to, to get a much broader picture than I think I might have previously. Ah, and I wanted to ask you about the cultural archive and, and myth making, because you talked about how that kind of impacted on your research. And I just wondered how how those kinds of myths have both, cons you know, are a barrier, but also can enhance the presence of, of trans lives in the in the past and their visibility and our understanding of them. Oh, Arne's muted. Can someone unmute, unmute my Arne? Okay, can you hear me? 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It uh, keeps happening to me. Um, uh, obviously, that uh, happens with the more prominent figures. And I also wanted to um, con contribute to what uh, previous speakers have said that um, you you start with um, it's a snowballing system. You, you start with some sources and they lead you to other sources. And it's really, really important to follow these up. Um, in, in my research, I, I mean, I, I looked also at fiction and there is a very early um, representation after the death of James Barry by in, in um, all the year round by Dickens, which is anonymous, but has some... Uh, has has some aspects of Dickens' writing. I'm pretty convinced that Dickens had a hand in it, uh, which sounds like um, a witness account, but which is obviously a construction. And the way in which different um, uh, different parts of um, literature, popular media, uh, and so on uh, act together, um, the um, that story which pretends to be a witness account, then um, it is taken up in, by, um, by um, a South African annual, um, winter annual, with a cartoon. And the cartoon is an illustration of the story. Um, and uh, it, it could, and then it it enters biography. So then, as as a historical, as hist historical fiction, then becomes a documentary source for biography. So um, it's very important to um, be aware that biography and biofiction and drama um, very often blend and merge, uh, and you have elements of um, factual. Uh, you have factual elements, but you also have a lot of construction uh, and and fictionalization, and that is sometimes the very difficult thing to disambiguate this and to uh, to find the real real life person behind the myth. And with very prominent people, the myth becomes the person, and uh, the the person themselves gets gets lost. But on the other hand, that mythologization that process that happens says something very important about the times, about our times and about our thinking about trans. So it's not, um, it's not wasted. Um, it's, it's actually, it's, it's also a documentary source that, um, um, from which we can learn and which we can analyze about our own constructions. Um, and um, with, with all this, um, merging of different sources, it's still very important to go back to the archives. Um, for example, there is an absolutely fascinating part of a letter by Florence Nightingale, which describes her encounter with Barry, which was a clash. And I had read that in various books and the letter itself uh, reads like a postmodern um, description because it changes the pronoun, he, she, she, he. Um, and this is in the original, this is in the original. Um, and it's it's just fantastic to um, go back to the source and find it. But then the source itself can be, as I said, confused because um, the um, representation of Bari that I talked about is very widely used in Bari criticism. Um, and, um, and um, I checked with Rachel Holmes as well. And when she um, wrote her biography, it was actually in the James Barry files. Um, and it was only later taken out when the error had been um, reconstructed and, and discovered. Um, I think it's, you know, it's an error that, again, is, is really uh, very says something about the construction of that figure and also how, I mean, how I personally see, see Barry. Um, but um, it, um, to, to uh, um, not to restrict oneself to one source of information, but to read widely and to research widely and to be open to all kinds of resources. Yeah, I think that's a, a absolutely key point. Thank you, Anne, um, and bringing them all together. Christine, you had... Uh, something you yes. Want yes, I just wanted to pick up on that because I think one of the, the important things, it's vitally important to be aware of actually who is producing the record 
Um, and that's as true with books that purport to be biographies as with some of these um, third party records um, that very often, even what cl claims to be an autobiography, such as April Ashley's, was actually um, ghostwritten by somebody uh, helping her to, to write it. Um, so, and the, obviously there's the influence of editors as well, producing a book that the publisher thinks that the largest audience wants to read. So uh, we also have to see books in terms of the period in which they were published. Um, and what they what they were serving to try and hook in audiences, which is I think why my criticism so often of um, of, of trans biography in the past is that it tends to be a story about my brave journey towards the operating theater, and the the story ends there as though nothing important ever happened afterwards. Whereas um, as being subversive, whenever I've written about uh, trans lives, it tends to be the other way around. I start where they've actually become themselves, because that's the really interesting part. But there are many sources now for, for modern research as well. Um, it, talking about this period of trans mutual support, organizations like the Beaumont Society and later the Gender Trust and an organization called the Self-Help Association for Transsexuals, these all produced regular magazines and um, one very valuable place to go, uh, and I would say start with places like Hall Carpenter Archive, um, is to look for those because those are actually written and edited by trans people in the moment, describing life as they saw it at that time. Um, and then later, when we became activists in the 1990s, uh, right from the word go when we took our activist legal campaign online, um, I was very keen to ensure that, because I know that things online can disappear as fast as they appear, that we had some way of ensuring some longevity to the history that we were producing in real time. Uh, and so I'm really, really pleased that the British Library, even after we sort of more or less folded up um, Press for Change, um, actually took uh, web snapshots of all of our work, which in turn was archiving what other people were saying, so that we have a, 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 an uninterrupted 10 year snapshot of the entire conversation about trans people from around about 1995 through to about 2007 or eight. Um, so that's an incredible trove to be researched by somebody who wants to go through that because you actually, you're there in the moment with that material. But subsequently, I'm also worried for the present because trans people today, the ones that have followed behind me and my colleagues, are actually making history right now. And my concern is that that history isn't being recorded. What you get recorded in the official places through the press is a completely distorted picture of our lives told through the lens of people who just want to say we're we're, we're deviant, we're, we're dangerous to women, um, we're trying to upend life as we know it. Um, and the dialogues that are taking place between trans people actually trying to counter that and move forwards are happening in places like Facebook, Twitter, in blogs. And those can disappear as quickly as they appeared. When I left Facebook a year ago, I wiped out 12 years worth of my own history. So uh, I think my message to, to people today would be, for God's sake, write it down, put it in books, keep a journal, keep, keep your files. In my lifetime, the format that emails have been stored in has changed four times. The format for word processors has changed three times. Uh, there are documents even as young as 2008, I can no longer read on my computer. Yet we, we really, if we're serious about providing good material for uh, another panel like this in a hundred years time to be able to make sense of the present, then we have to make sure that that stuff is saved and preserved and cherished so that it can be studied in the future. Otherwise, there's just going to be the Sunday Times or the Daily Mail 
and we don't want to be remembered that way. No, totally. And I completely agree. And I think there's, it's important to remember if you are involved in these histories to consider depositing them in an archive, um, you know, as, as soon as possible. Or it just makes it a lot easier to make exhibitions, to tell stories about trans lives if the collections are there, if they're visible. So I think, you know, if you're, if you're involved in anything, please consider doing that. Um, I know Bishopgate um, archives have uh, have got some trans collections, um, but there's lots of archives. Your local record office, just depositing it is 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 the important thing, um, not just for historians but for public understanding as well. So I think the time has come for this incredibly rich and yeah, just stimulating panel to come to an end. I want to thank the four speakers for taking us through this whirlwind trip through the Trans Archive and thank you. I think the enormous interest in this event shows that there is immense hunger for understanding these histories, for delving into them deeper and also for using these histories to, you know, to make claims that, you know, trans, trans lives, trans people are obviously not a postmodern construction, have a very long and rich history and enrich the world if that even needs to be said, it's obvious. But um, thank you again and see you next time or around. Bye. <laughs>